May we be seated, please. is also high in one way or the other. So everybody is sitting on the high table. Now I will invite the speaker of today, the guest. Actually, she's not that guest because she always come here every year for just three. But today, she's a guest to us. Uh, we have Professor Sharon Fon, uh, and she's the co-director of Qatar, uh, Qatar program in the uh, in South Africa and also in Nigeria, um, we have Professor Sharon. I mean, Sharon, uh, we are welcome. I'm not here to introduce her. Professor, we also introduce her later. Please come up to the i-table, ma. So she's our guest speaker today. She's loaded. She has a lot to deliver today. Please ready, take your pen, take your recorder and record and learn a lot from her. Thank you very much. Ayo, you always, um, you always think everybody knows what Qatar is. Qatar means Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa. Thank you very much for that. Well, Qatar has been a household name in the University of Ibadan, even in Nigeria, because Qatar has made many of us. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah, so it's an household name. Now I will invite, by protocol, we have uh, Professor Iyo Ayola, the DVC administration. Professor Oluyemisi A. Bamigoshe San. DVC Research, Innovation, and Strategic Partnership. We have in the house Mr. J. O. Salu, the registrar of this university, ably represented by Dr. Morom Folua Oyebola. You're welcome, huh? I have to say Morom Folua. She's very, very much proud of that name, and I love it. You're welcome, huh? So please, let's clap as she's coming to the i-table. Thank you very much. Next, we have Mr. Adewi Popola, the Bursa. And again, we have Dr. Masi Iroan Ganachi, the university librarian, ably represented by the College of Medicine Liberian, College Liberian, yeah, medical librarian, Dr. Grace Ajuwon. You are welcome, ma'am. So she's 
having double cap today, you know, on our own capacity as a medical librarian and also representing the university librarian. Um, now we invite the host, though the host is the, is the vice chancellor, but we are in the soil of the College of Medicine. We invite Professor Olayinka O Omigbodun, the Provost College of Medicine. Every represented by the Deputy Provost, Professor A.F. Adeniyi. You are welcome, sir. So thank you for hosting us. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Informed that the BOSA is ably represented by Mr. A.A. Adiago. Or is it? All right, sir. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Please come up, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Now, we also go ahead to introduce Professor ASO Ogunjuyigbe, the Provost Postgraduate College of this great university. Represented? Yeah, we know that. Now, we need to bring more people to the table here. I want to invite Professor Uche Iziogo Abanehe, the former, the pioneer focal person of Qatar. You are welcome, sir. Please, Osha, please bring my professor to the high table. Thank you. Tuji Odedele, apology, I should not forget that name. Mr. Odedele, you are welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm also professor. Standing on existing protocols and saying on behalf of the uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ibadan, Professor Kayode Adebuale, FASMNI, this address has been read on his behalf. The Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, CARTA, was established in 2010 to support the development of a critical mass of capable and competent researchers, leading to a vibrant African academy, able to impact public and population health positively. Qatar encourages junior faculty to undertake doctoral training locally and supports them to become internationally recognized research leaders. Qatar also contributes to strengthening research institutions to enable them to support innovative and policy-relevant research. The University of Ibadan was a founding partner when the CATA program launched in 2010. Since 2013, the University of Ibadan has hosted the Joint Advanced Seminar 3, the third in a series of four such seminars with the acronym JS3 for each cohort of CATA fellows. The JS3 public lecture series commenced with that first JS, with a, that first JS3. Qatar has also held other distinguished lectures and workshops in the University of Ibadan. Today's lecture is one of the distinguished lectures organized on our campus through the Qatar Initiative. Qatar UI was coordinated by two distinguished professors of our university that we're proud of. Professor Akin Yinkaomi and Professor Uchi Isigua Banie. Thank you very much. From 2010 until 2015, when Dr. Olufunke Fayeun, Godu, and Dr. Fayeun have excelled at coordinating one of our most productive and rewarding partnerships in the last decade. Within the past 13 years of the Carter UI collaboration, I'm pleased to note that both UI focal persons have led the Carter Consortium as board chairs and represented the University of Ibadan creditably. More importantly, the Carter collaboration has consistently benefited the university in terms of research and administrative capacity building, institutional strengthening, infrastructural development, and attracting new research grants. On research capacity building, an estimated $3.6 million from the consortium has been invested in supporting 36 UI personnel for doctoral training over the past 12 years. Presently, 20 have graduated, 
while 16 fellows are still in their PhD programs at Ibadan or other Qatar partner institutions outside Nigeria. That's not all. Through the postdoctoral awards and reentry grants established to enable Qatar fellows complete the, the doctoral program to make the transition to being independent research leaders, 10 UI Qatar graduates have benefited from additional support amounting to an estimated $500,000. These are in addition to the numerous opportunities and assistance that UI Carter Fellows have enjoyed as internships, short courses, conference attendance, and funding for open access publishing. To whom much is given, much is expected. So, I'm glad to note that Carter Fellows and graduates from the University of Ibadan have flourished and distinguished themselves with 646 publications and still counting in reputable scientific outlets. These have amassed 6,245 citations. Qatar alumni and fellows are still contributing significantly to showcasing University of Ibadan. A look at the Qatar Evidence website shows that UI has the most publications among Qatar institutions. This is followed by the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Specifically, more than one out of every five publications, that's 23% uh, from all Qatar fellows, is from UI. Truly beneficiaries of Qatar from UI are leaving a mark in their fields and impacting our university and our society. Besides Qatar's doctoral and postdoctoral programs, our partnerships with the consortium has facilitated grant funding from several agencies. Some of that funding has supported the training of UI faculty, librarians, administrators, and finance specialists. For example, more than 300 UI staff have been trained locally and internationally through the capacity building project for faculty and administrative staff, FAS, on research. And on research administration and management. In addition, in 2014, UI Carter obtained a $20,000 grant from all, for online subscriptions for journals in the medical library and the first turn, turnitin plagiarism checker used in the university. Our university has also benefited from infrastructural grants at different times. 78,000 pounds in 2014 and $50,000 in 2017. The grants went into improving infrastructure all over the university. Some projects in this regard include the postgraduate hostel block at Alexander Brown Hall and the Carter Postgraduate Seminar Room in the Oladele Adjose Building. Carter efforts contributed to the electrification of the E. Latunio Deku Building and the renovation of the Faculty of Social Sciences Library and the Postgraduate Study Room. Let me conclude that as a university, we are proud of the respectful partnerships we have nurtured with Carter over the years. We are also proud of our academic and non-academic staff who have participated in Carter in various forms. We are glad to have Carter co-director, Professor Sharon Fon, of the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa, and visiting scholar, scholar at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, here today to deliver the lecture, the 10th Carter Public Lecture. Her commitment to excellence, integrity, mentorship, and research leadership has been most helpful in driving and sustaining the Carter Partnership. The University of Ibadan, the very first and the best will continue to be a dependable and supportive partner through the next phases of Carter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ma, for your, the chairman's opening remarks. Um, we'd like to recognize um, a few more dignitaries. Um, uh, well, it gives me great pleasure to recognize the Dean, Faculty of Public Health, Professor 
G R E E Anna. Could you please come forward, sir? Thank you, sir. The Dean, Faculty of Agri, Professor Stella. Thank you. Could you please come forward, sir? And this is the time that I need to welcome the Tata Fellows from all over the world. Could you please wave your hand? Tata Fellows, Tata graduates, Tata family. You're welcome once again. Now we move on to the presentation of our guest lecturer, and this will be taken by Professor Ilugodi. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and um, it's good to be able to order Sharon around. <laughs> so, can you stand here? <laughs> yes, where they can see you. <laughs> yes, Professor Sharon Fon, um, co-director of the Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, is professor at the School of Public Health at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, and currently a visiting professor at the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Professor Fon obtained a basic medical degree from the University of Witwatersrand, And she subsequently obtained a postgraduate diploma in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And another postgraduate diploma in occupational health from the University of the Witwatersrand. She pursued specialist training in, in community health and she's a fellow of the Faculty of Community Health of the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa and is registered as a specialist public health practitioner. Subsequently, she pursued a PhD degree in community health, also from WITS. Her PhD research was in the area of occupational epidemiology including environmental assessment, which she did with the Food and Canning Workers Union in South Africa in the 1980s. Uh, her areas of expertise include research capacity development, gender and rights, women's health, uh, policy development and implementation, health systems research, research methods training, national and international multi-country studies and curriculum development. As you can see, rather than being a super specialist in one particular area, she has taken a multidisciplinary approach using a mix of methods and systems to work in a range of areas with the aim of impacting on policy and implementation of health and related interventions to improve population health outcomes. She has been the head of the School of Public Health at WITS for 10 years and also she has occupied the position of Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences uh, of her university. She currently, of course, co-leads uh, CATA and she's also been past president, or she's also past president of the Association of Schools of Public Health in Africa. Um, she's currently co-chair of the World Health Organization's Research Project Review Panel, RP2.
and she has worked in various research related capacities for a large uh, number of international agencies. I'll in WHO, the World Bank, the United Nations uh, Population Fund, uh, DFID, the Swedish uh, International Development Agency, uh, as well as the National Institutes of Health of the United States. Um, she's not just all about research, research, research. She also is a very active participant in community life at WITS. And she served um, on the University Council at WITS from 2013 up till 2022. Uh, particularly, this Distinguished Scientist Award for contributions to the quality of life of women in 2005. She was elected to the Academy of Science of South Africa in 2004 and was a Woodrow Wilson Center Scholar in 2009 and a Fulbright Senior Research Scholar at the University of Southern California, um, the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health from 2019 to 2020. She was the first woman to deliver the annual TN Krishnan Memorial Lecture at the Sri Chitra Institute in Kerala, India. She is widely published in peer-reviewed journals. At the last count, more than 130 publications. But more importantly, she's not just writing for a scholarly audience or for the academic community. She has produced many lay educational publications consistent with her belief that academic knowledge needs to be widely distributed for all to access and understand. She was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden in 2015. Please welcome with me an erudite scholar, super driving force behind Qatar and quite a number of other initiatives that have turned around the face of academia in Africa. So it is not a surprise that today she will be talking about academia and she will be looking at it from a public health perspective. Professor Sharon Fung. Thank you so very much. Um, one of the things about um, being able to raise money for Carter is that we can only do it because we're a fantastic team. Um, and so any ability to raise money is a reflection of UI as much as it is of anything else. In opening, I really want to thank you for considering me worthy of giving this talk and inviting me. It's both an honor and a pleasure to be here in one of the few African countries that has the most fabulous cuisine. I really love Someone take this away. I'm sorry. Do we need that? I, um, I really love to eat in Nigeria. And um, I'm lucky enough to do this in conversation with Nigerian colleagues who I enjoy stimulating and um, intellectually engaging discussions with. Of course, as you'd expect, with your esteemed senior academics, but even more so with the early career researchers that I have the pleasure of meeting here. I want to reflect for a moment on this venue that we're in. It's the J. Paul Hendrickson Lecture Theatre, and of course when I saw the name I thought, Hendrickson, this is not a Nigerian name. Sounds very familiar. And so I found out that in fact he is a South African 
who did his medical degree um, in South Africa and then went on to do his specialty in obstetrics and gynecology in the UK and then came to work here um, at UI where he was professor of obstetrics and gynecology for many years. And he spent his entire life here, his whole academic life and his whole life. And he died here in Nigeria, his new home. And this illustrates one of the points that I want to emphasize and we'll come back to later. And that is about collaboration between African institutions. Today, what I'm trying to do is think aloud with you about what universities are for, their purpose. Internationally, we all express what we do very similarly. We educate, we teach, we do so at the national or international level, and all of them are worthwhile and important. So turning from service, there's then teaching and research. And some universities place more emphasis on one of these roles than another. And I want to say that I think that that's very appropriate. A differentiated higher education system is actually a positive thing, which allows countries to meet the variety of national needs and allows it to offer the range of options to have universities that offer degrees at the bachelor and master's level. We need an educated population. These graduates can and do work in many governmental and non-governmental institutions in business. They become good teachers to teach in our schools. They become educated and smart administrators to run many institutions in our society, including running our soccer federations, although I will say I'm a little disappointed with the South African Soccer Federation. I don't think we've crowned ourselves in glory and you always, always beat us. We also need research intensive universities to do research and research training. These research intensive universities produce our PhDs and should be home to African and to international postdoctoral students. Such graduates will be the people who will continually renew our, our research intensive universities. They should also staff all our other universities, our TVET colleges, as well as taking up many other roles in society. So this is what we do. However, oftentimes we don't do it that well. And when that happens, I would argue that it's a result of many things, but two important things that I think are both fixable. The one is we don't always give the jobs, the teaching posts, the heads of institutions to the best candidates. Appointments are not always both based on merit. And this is true in South Africa. It's certainly true in conversation with my other colleagues in the rest of Africa. And I will tell you that this is not exclusive to Africa at all. It happens everywhere. But I want to tell you that we can choose to change that. And that's one of the things that we should be doing. Our second problem is that we expect people to deliver when they're not surrounded by well-functioning systems. To have a good higher education system, you need a good, edu you need a good education, an entire education system, from preschool all the way. To be effective in higher education, you need to have functional support systems, fit for purpose rules and regulations, good HR and IT systems and functioning infrastructure. Administrators, while often not acknowledged and recognized in the way that we academics are, are essential to what higher education institutions can achieve. So you see, madam, I wasn't complimenting you. I was speaking from the heart about what I think is important. Um, and so I want to recognize you and registrars of universities and administrators all over. So we have to admit that sometimes we don't do things well, but we also have to note that everywhere in Africa there are outstanding institutions or departments or centers. So it's not that we don't have the ability, we absolutely do. So, 
I put that caveat in because I don't want to pretend that everything's perfect and everything's rosy. But I still want to get to that point of what we're for, never mind what we do. And I also have to, we have to argue why governments and others should put their money into higher education. From now on, I'm going to focus really on intensive, research intensive universities, as the University of Ibadan is one such, and my university, WITS, is. And we are both members of the African Research Universities Alliance, Arua. My other home university, the University of Gothenburg, is also a research intensive university. And I also think that when you are talking, it's probably much better to talk something you know, at least you know something about. Otherwise, maybe you shouldn't be speaking and have some experience of. But I'm also focusing on these institutions because they have or can have a very particular role in society. So, what are these research intensive universities and what are they for? The argument is that every country needs some kind of national research system. What is a national research system? It comprises universities, public research institutions, governmental and non-governmental organizations, private research capabilities from the private sector, investments both national and international, public and private. The argument is that without this, a country cannot participate in what today is called the global knowledge economy. So why is participating in the global knowledge economy important? Like all of you, I am aware, and the COVID-19 pandemic illustrated this brutally and bluntly, that African countries urgently need to manufacture an entire range of goods locally. We have to provide good social safety nets for our populations. We have to have reliable infrastructure. We have to have functional health systems. We need to decrease inequality within and between countries. And perhaps most importantly, we have to offer our young African population, the youngest continent in the world, a future where they can and use their, where they can use their time in fulfilling ways. They feel they, they they have to feel that they have a stake here in Africa, where they can want to and are able to make a contribution in Africa. So consequently, we need to develop, and that is why Africa has to participate in the knowledge economy. There are some about development that no one else is better placed to answer than Africans in African universities. Let's choose an example to make it more concrete. Our slums, in South Africa we call them informal settlements, but they are slums. We need to find smart ways to manage human waste in our informal settlements. Given the layout and the density of our slums, the waste management systems was introduced. Evidence, the policy was slowly left to die, though not quickly and not systematically enough, and not with an honest acknowledgement that it was wrong by the people who put it forward. And actually, there's still people today who believe it's true, in spite of the evidence, to suggest that it didn't work. I think that we can conclude that the evidence suggests that the policy itself was wrong. I want to take another policy example that is relevant to Africa and higher education. I'll be brief because I think many of you know this. And again, this occurred at a similar time when capitalism was unbridled, when the question of the state, uh, the value of the state was questioned. Advice was given, and it was given in particular to African countries, that the return on investment was much higher when money went to primary education. You know, as a South African, I can't hear that without also hearing the echoes of racist apartheid. You know, the architect of apartheid said that South African black people were really to be, he said, the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. 
He turned to religious texts to justify abuses against human rights. And we see this happening again and again, even now, all over the world. Let's remember the women of Afghanistan. So the idea was that investment in African tertiary education and research intensive university was seen as an unnecessary luxury for Africa. And frankly, I cannot see this as anything but racist. This has had dire consequences for African universities. From, to quote from one of the references that I have included in the bibliography at the end of this talk, public expenditure per tertiary student has fallen from $6,800 in 1980 to $1,200 in, uh, in 2002. That's a decrease of 82% per student. Many tertiary institutions shut down and were and still are underfunded. In fact, in South Africa, as recently as 1996, the reconstruction and development program that guided the first democratic government in South Africa was jettisoned in favor of the growth, e employment, and redistribution five-year plan called GEAR, gearing the economy. This was an attempt, firstly, to recognize that we really were in a very constrained fiscal space, so there was a problem. But in part, it was, allowed, was to allow South Africa to honor its international debt so that it could continue to keep a good rating. Due to decreased public investment, as one example, nursing colleges were closed down at the very time that the HIV epidemic was soaring, needing more, not fewer healthcare workers. Our human resources for health in South Africa have not recovered to this day. The tide did eventually turn on opinion about investing beyond primary education in Africa. And important new research exemplified by a paper, The University System, Engine of Development in the New World Economy by Castells, and again the references in the paper, began to influence international thinking and advice. Interesting, the World Bank itself, after having promoted investment in primary schooling only, started to recognize and support higher education and its role in development. So again, the point I'm trying to make here is that the policy itself was flawed. I don't want to again ignore the fact that there are other factors that are also important in African countries' road to development. Here, I have to look no further than my own country. We have not had the right people in the right jobs. We've had leaders, technocrats, petty bureaucrats, and their partners in very well-known, big, the big four accounting firms and private sector player who have ranged from incompetent to totally corrupt. And for those that have tried to do a, do a good job, they have been stuck in a dysfunctional system which hampers their ability to deliver. Some who have tried to expose corruption have had their lives totally ruined and some have been murdered for doing this. I have to stop and remember at least one of these people. Bab Babita Diokaran was a woman who worked in the finance department in the Gauteng Department of Health, a province in South Africa, our richest province. She had found approximately 227 companies involved in likely corrupt dealings with the Department of Health. She exposed a one billion rand corruption at Tembisa Hospital, a big referral hospital in the province. She was killed in a hail of bullets in her driveway after dropping her child at work for working with the authorities to try and expose this corruption. So let us at least acknowledge that even if we did have the right policies, in some cases they might not have succeeded. 
because of vested interests. And these vested interests are not only in the public sector, they are in the private sector too. And we have to question our values. So, so far, I've opened up the conversation about what universities are for and put on the agenda that our institutions, our universities, have a role to play in the development of our countries. But is there any evidence that universities do contribute? Are they important to development? A strong correlation association has been found between higher education participation rates and levels of development. But we have to ask ourselves which came first, the chicken or the egg? Using information from a book by Nico Cluti, the university and his, and his co-authors, Universities and Economic Development in Africa, published by the Center for Higher Education Transformation in 2011, they claim that there's increasing evidence that high levels of higher education in particular are essential for the design and productive use of technologies. So I come back to the point I made about what we need in Africa and we, what we saw exposed during the COVID pandemic. That they pro provide foundations for a nation's innovative capacity and contribute, and this is interesting, more than any other social institution to the development of civil society. And if we are going to be able to hold our leaders accountable, we need vibrant civil society. And I hope it is true that universities do and are the most important institutions in developing strong civil society. It would make my life's work and I think your life's work feel much more worthwhile if we knew that, even if we might not see it immediately. In this book, they go on to describe different, how different countries have interpreted and used this evidence. Countries like Finland, South Korea, Singapore, Denmark, Australia, and New Zealand have placed education, knowledge, and information technology central to their development policy. The Chinese and Indian economies have grown using this information, and the, the um, authors tell us that what sent China and India apart from the other South Asia, so-called in the 1980s, um, East Asian tigers, is that in China and India, they d invested simultaneously across the education system, primary, secondary, and tertiary, all at the same time. What I am taking from this is that there is a relationship between higher education and development, but what I'm also taking from this is that we need to work across the entire educational system, and in a way it's also a lesson to us, of course we're proud of our institutions and we compete, but actually we're all part of a system, we all need each other. So we also need it not because it's a nice to have, but it's essential. It's essential because it's a way of every individual ultimately getting a better life and for nations to develop. So what about research? Why is research important? It matters that science, for example, has allowed us to develop vaccines. It's important that we can prevent an enormous number of deaths and suffering of children and families because we can vaccinate children. It matters that we have a population that is educated enough to be able to understand the benefits of vaccines and who are informed and free to make a choice to use them. It matters that we have economists who can do the calculations that indicate to government that even if it does cost money to make vaccines available, the benefits outweigh those investments. It matters that we have philosophers and social scientists that can make the link between access to vaccines and our government's agreements to promote human rights. It matters that we have health systems that can deliver these vaccines and researchers who can try to understand what is wrong with dysfunctional health systems and how to improve them. This is the stuff of research intensive universities. From blue sky research that will only find application later and maybe will never find application to applied research. And it matters because it makes people's lives better.
And that is what research intensive universities are for. They are there to contribute to society. This is true in Africa as much as it is true anywhere else in the world. We need named after a South African. I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and context. We all collaborate, and I think to a de 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 great, greater degree with non-African researchers than we do with each other. Part of that is, of course, determined by where the money research for research comes from, and that's why we need to have more African investment in research. But I think that some of us also prefer that. We give credit to those global northern partners. We like to be seen with them. We think we're more important. I want to argue that this is a lost opportunity. Many of us have written in our research that context matters. And I spoke about how we in Africa are best placed to answer some of our development problems. And, come, and, I, and I came up with the example of human waste management in slums. Because context matters, those who are most familiar with the context are the ones who should be doing the research in that context. That research on Africa must be done and in fact led by Africans. This does not mean we should not be working with others across the world, but it does mean that we should be conceptualizing the questions that need answering and how they should be answered, and analyzing our own data, whatever the form of that data, whether it's human tissues with high-tech mechanisms of looking at them, whether it's numbers and big data, or whether it's part of the human genome. Partnerships and exchanges between Africans, African institutions, and African countries is one area that we should be exploiting to the full. We have fine examples of where we've done this. And we need to celebrate and build on such partnerships. The Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa is one such example, where we have pooled the collective talent and enterprise from a range of African universities and African research centers. And we have developed a curriculum to improve our PhD training, and we have produced internationally competitive graduates. The transferable skills that the Carter curriculum can provide is an essential component of all PhD training internationally irrespective of the discipline from which that PhD candidate is coming. And the Carter, go, the Carter program goes further by building the institutional capacity of our member institutions so that we can re support research and research training. So in order to achieve our purpose, to realize what we are for rather than just list what we do, I want to give a few examples about how we've done that. And I will start in broader terms and then move on to some very specific examples. And again, I want to start with the caveat of saying that I want to state up front that I'm very well aware of the barriers to research excellence. We, that includes your previous VC, as well as all the Carter VCs and I published an article together where we described the history and spoke about the barriers to research intensive higher education institutions in Africa. I've included that paper as well in the bibliography of this talk. Much of it has to do with inadequate infrastructure of many kinds. Some of it is about the structural inequality between the global north and south. Some of it has to do with chronic underfunding of universities. And talking about chronic underfunding of universities, I want to stop here and acknowledge the long-standing and brave and what I think seems to have been a successful strike that everyone here in Nigeria um, endured and the suffering that both the staff and students you stood together and you made the case that investment in higher education is essential. I hope that the commitments from your government will turn into action.
So while I do acknowledge that there are some real problems, we also have to acknowledge that there are some things we are in control of. So let's turn to those. I spoke earlier of the kinds of policies that have been suggested to African countries, and I made the point that, that at least for some of them, they are based on an understanding of how the world works, an opinion, a point of view, rather than evidence. And I think that universities have a singularly important role. And that role is to make people understand the value of evidence and to produce that evidence. I think that universities have to do research and they have to do high quality research and they have to teach research methods. And this requires us to, to make clear how to be rigorous in collecting and using and interpreting data. It means we have to differentiate evidence from opinion. It means we have to make clear how evidence is generated and what constitutes good versus bad research. We have to have our research peer-reviewed and published in reputable journals. And that's one of the things that we can and should and are doing now. We have to do it more. And what we also have to produce is local evidence to inform policy and practice. We must teach research methods so that our students, and particularly our PH graduate, PhD graduates, know the difference between opinion and evidence and can produce, be the producers of re research going into the future. This is something we can do now, even while we face constraints. This is the academic be at work and engaging with each other, why our doors of our offices have to be open so that someone can pop in to test an idea with us. It is this skill, being able to gather evidence, weigh it up, synthesize, critique, no good from bad science, good from, good from bad methods, that makes it possible to say that universities contribute more than any other social institution to the development of civil society. Because once you've been in the university and been taught to think critically, you can be a useful member of society. If we're not producing critical thinkers, we are failing as institutions. The other thing that I think that we can do now is to work across disciplines. I keep going back to my story about human waste, but to realize my idea of an income generating industry in slums that simultaneously deals with human waste. We need chemists, engineers, health experts, social scientists, economists, and basic scientists. We need to work with communities and ensure that they benefit. It's their urine off to say that to realize what universities are actually for, we have to go further than being interdisciplinary in our approach. If we want to be the engines of development, we have to be transdisciplinary in our approach. What is transdisciplinarity? That is where not only do we bring multiple relevant disciplines to work jointly together, but we engage with stakeholders who have an interest in that area we're doing research in and the community that we are working with, and we engage with them to define the problem to use their insights and expertise to design solutions and where the ownership of outcomes and benefits are shared. And this approach illustrates again how universities can contribute to development and to greater equality. Perhaps this has been a bit off what you might have thought is a public health perspective. So let's get a little bit more health orientated. What are the biggest problems we still face in health in Africa? We continue with two high levels of maternal mortality, we still bear a huge burden of infectious diseases, and we have enormous and increasing burden of non-communicable diseases. Many of these can be dealt with simultaneously with cross-cutting social interventions. Research has shown that barriers to good maternal health care have much to do with physical access, getting to the places where services and quality care do exist. 
There have been interventions that can change this. Build roads, build social solidarity so that people help each other to get to centres. One of the factors that changed access to healthcare in one South African province had nothing to do in maternal healthcare in particular, had nothing to do with healthcare providers or technology. They just decided that instead of the ambulances being stationed at the referral hospital, they transferred the ambulances to the periphery, to the places where the people had to come from, and they cut down by half the time it took for a pregnant woman in trouble to get to a service centre where they could help her. So we have to start thinking outside of the box and outside of just te technological solutions. If you want to deal with deaths from diarrhoea, evidence has shown that the single most important intervention is providing clean water, not rotavirus vaccines, not all sorts of other interventions that require drugs or technology. If you want to deal with the epidemic of non-communicable diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, and in Africa, this epidemic is frightening. We've only just begun to see the beginning of it. We need a situation where the most accessible, widely distributed commodity is not Coca-Cola. What I am saying is if we want to impact on health, we need to pay at least as much attention to the social and commercial determinants of health as we do to technology. And this is where I think public health has a very important role to play. I want to make this concrete and give an interesting example of one research university at a university and what it's doing. I'm using this example because it's an African unit set up by Africans, run in Africa. It is multi a multidisciplinary unit which takes a transdisciplinary approach. It has used science, built evidence and evidence base, and is engaged with stakeholders. And in a very short period, it's only, I think, maybe eight years old, I think in its first three years, it had already impacted on policy. And it's also building the next generation of researchers. And I'm going to tell you a story of just a small part of its work. The name of the unit is Priceless. And it's a research unit which I have nothing to do with beyond being in the same school, in the School of Public Health at WITS. And when I first met the researchers, they were doing work on stroke. How much was there? And how do you measure accurately the burden of disease? They found out the cost of stroke to the health system. And they used that evidence to talk to government about the problems of stroke. Now, you could say the best way to prevent stroke is to treat high blood pressure, because it's people who have high blood pressure who get strokes. But this is a story we, for those of us who are medical practitioners, know the story. And this is true in the best environment, never mind in Africa, that only about 50% of people who have high blood pressure are diagnosed with blood, high blood pressure. And only about 50% who are diagnosed get treatment. And only in about 50% of those who get treatment do we see good blood pressure control. So the people in Priceless went one step further back. And they said that one of the important factors that led to high blood pressure is salt increase, is um, salt intake. And that salt is an important contributory factor to high blood pressure that led to stroke. And in South Africa, and increasingly in all countries, access to highly processed food, high in salt, high in sugar, is very easy. They are cheap, they are available, and they are unhealthy. In South Africa, bread is a main staple, and people eat large amounts of bread every day from very early age. And it had a very high salt content. And the high salt content, by the way, 
is there because it preserves the bread quite well and it was good for the companies because they could store it for a longer period of time. So through lobbying and working with civil society and with government, regulations were parts which limited the amount of salt in bread. And the people making bread said, people won't like the taste anymore. And we said, okay, you can decrease the level of salt bit by bit over some months so that we won't notice that the taste has changed. And people are buying just as much bread now as they were then. So part of their work um, also mapped out advertising boards that promoted unhealthy food, especially sugar-sweetened beverages. They found that these adverts were concentrated especially around schools and especially in, pu in poorer communities. They were combining research methods to understand how the social determinants of health work. They managed complex projects in health using econometrics, health economic evaluation, legal and policy analysis to build their evidence. They employed doctors, statisticians, economists, lawyers, and social scientists, and they all work together on one problem. They provide evidence to policymakers to improve resource allocation, reduce waste, and get a better return on investment for health for the South African population. They define public engagement as part of their academic role and use multiple channels to engage, including meetings and discussions with policymakers. When they were doing the sugar sweetened beverage work, one person met with every single political party in the country to try and get them to understand why they thought that regulating access to sugar-sweetened beverages were important. They wrote opinion pieces in the news media. They wrote articles in the publication The Conversation, which helps academics write in a way that a lay person can understand. They did interviews on radio, they held public meetings, and they provided evidence to organizations, one which is called HeLa in South Africa, which is a coalition of civil society organizations that advocates for equitable access to affordable, nutritious food for all in South Africa which is a right enshrined in Section 27 of the South African Constitution. Their work on sugar-sweetened beverages resulted in a tax on these beverages. And since that tax, they have done other work. And they have produced evidence to show that the tax has decreased the amount of these beverages that are consumed, and particularly among the poor. The tax has worked. They are using fiscal levers and working with the South African Treasury to make a health impact. It's an example of health in all policies. And here is a concrete example about how research-intensive universities can improve health. In closing, I want to recognize, and all of us to stop and think, that to go to a university in South Africa is a rare privilege. Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the largest regions in the world with a population of over one billion people in 48 countries. Tertiary enrollment, enrollment, not graduation rates, tertiary enrollment is just under 10% compared to the global average of 38%. To work in a university is an even greater privilege. Yes, we may complain our salaries are low, and they are. But we also have a freedom in our work that few other employees have. I have always felt that privilege comes with responsibility. I think we have to stand up and be counted as members of our academy. We have to do the work that contributes to development in our countries. We have to do it in a way that allows us to have the greatest impact. And often I think this means taking a transdisciplinary approach. 
We have to be at the forefront of changing our institutions to make them the engine of development that they could be. But not just any kind of development and economic growth, the kind of development and economic growth that results in greater equality. We need to ensure that the next generation has something to look forward to. But within our own academic community, we need to turn around and see who is coming up behind us. And we have to give them the skills. But most importantly, we have to step back and give them the, pay, the space to surpass us. We have to challenge meaningless hierarchy built on tradition or culture or class or race or gender. We have to favor merit above those old hierarchies. This is the role of good academics, and this is the role we have to play, and we have to turn our academies into places that makes them a contribution to development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sharon Fon, for that inspirational and very thought-provoking lecture. I just want you to know that when I grow up, I want to be like you. Thank you very much. This is beautiful. And I picked some words. It's to tackle complexity in public health challenges, working across disciplines, and engaging with communities is very crucial. And that is what Qatar is doing multidisciplinary and she said further that inter or intra and interdisciplinary all these are very, very important you cannot do it alone for example i'm from library communication science but yet i'm also in public health so all of us we can do it together thank you so much for telling us what we do well what we could do better identifying the problems. You know, it was as if you had a checklist and I was ticking and ticking and ticking. And thank you so much for that. For bringing to our notice the importance of research intensive universities, the importance of transdisciplinarity. I'm sure Professor Anna was happy when Sharon was talking about wealth to uh, waste to wealth. And it, it was just such a wonderful lecture. I feel if we decided to summarize, you might be in for another lecture. So thank you once again. Great lecture that should be shared across the world, even to the Africans in diaspora. We need partnerships with the Africans in diaspora that want to build up our nations. And I'm so excited that you brought up the issues of the World Bank and the various uh, other initiatives of the um, of the Western economies in the ways that they have influenced the trajectory of our educational systems and said, okay, in the 80s, decrease the funding for education and how it has affected our tertiary education. But also the role of the academy in coming back to say, look, we need to invest more in tertiary education. We need innovative ways to massify education. Transdisciplinary research is extremely important because there are ways that we can ensure that people can even become literate using simple things like technology of tablets, putting books, making them available to young people in rural areas, using solar technology, working with the philosophers and the social scientists. There's so much to digest with this. Thank you so much. I'm really excited by what I've heard. Thank you, Ma, for your comments. While we're waiting for other comments, Comments. Um, please check. Um, we have some viewers online. Please check if there are any questions as well. We have over 50 people watching this online. And the very good thing about it is this. You can also visit and watch again. So we are there so I can learn from what we've had today. Questions? Comments? All right, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, you know, uh, for the erudite lecture and for going intersectorally, you know. Number one, our academics, are they going to stay aloof indefinitely from politics and development? We do know that a 
academics, they are indispensable to knowledge dissemination. And knowledge is very basic and fundamental to all the development aspirations, which my sister has mentioned. And the guest lecturer also mentioned a lot of them, that academics need not to be aloof from the town. So now, with the resources of Africa, which is nonetheless very robust, but the impact, there have been politics, there have been democracy for more than 20 years, actually 60 years of independence, African states. Yet, there's no evidence of any development in terms of individual development. There's no evidence of that. Why? So how can academics help not to be aloof from politics of the day? Because politics control everything, including the South Carolina. At the campus level, at the continental level, and at the individual researcher level. So ethically speaking, according to Cameroon and Green, the ethics, ethics is basic, good and bad, but the utilitarians, they believe in satisfying many needs. The deontologists, they believe that any act that is not a taker is not good. The consequentialist, where we can actually box the so-called corrupt people. I don't even know whether everybody is not corrupt too. Because, before, because we are watching corruption alone, we are part of corruption. Because we have means and ways. Okay, politicians, they flow from your power of voting. But most people now, you can, you can discourage me, you can, you, can, you can disagree with me. After voting, Africans are very agile in voting. After voting, they kept aloof. So when they got the power, they have access to treachery. Then politics control everything. They also control the economy and the treachery. So how many continents, how many years and generations are African academics going to be watching, you know, the politicians? And most politicians, they also flow from academics, pastors, lawyers, and so on. So the advanced countries and the developing countries, what's the difference? The only difference is that they have better follow-up by educated people. If you see here, UK and US, and Africa here, UK and US, they are better, they've changed PMs three times in three years in UK. Because politics is complex. It's not that they are more competent and more, less corrupt than us. So please, don't let academics be indifferent to politics. Then again, more academics should be very, 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 you know, grassroots oriented. Because, like I'm saying now, I have a lot of raw material shared on LinkedIn with 91 articles in less than 10 years. And I can let you know one such one I saw on the road the day I didn't go out at all as a writer. All right. I saw two, uh, see, please listen. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Could you this round example up so really... we can have other people Okay, okay, comment. okay, God bless. Thank okay. you for okay. identifying the Thank problems very much, and the need. Even on the YouTube, for... you can go and also put more comments. as a place to put comments so I can read more. Thank yeah. you so much for that. A Kata fellow also wants to give a comment from here. Please, could you introduce yourself before uh, um, commenting so we know who we're talking to? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Yinka Adifolari. Uh, Professor Sharon, thank you very much for that uh, inspiring lecture. Um, I don't want to repeat what, as, what others have said, but my opinion or what I want to submit, it might be relevant for the future is that African leaders, it's good that the lecture focused on the academia and the policy, but our leaders in Africa, if we are to do collaboration and um, I mean research and development, our politicians, our leaders need also to be lectured. And I want Carter to also look at this side for the future where we can target Afri rich African leaders and enlighten them. And uh, maybe have an institute where African leaders can pass through, African aspirants, I mean leaders that want to go into uh, politics can pass through a school, a school where they can, I mean, reorientate them how to use policy, uh, the science, evidence and all that, because that is a very huge gap. People come from their, 
from the farm, the contest, they win an election, they become president, they come from cattle rearing, they become leaders, you know, from different, no school to pass through. That's a missing gap. So if Qatar can look into this in the future, it will strike a balance because the funding also has to come from Africa. We cannot develop, we depend on the developed countries all our lives. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that comment. And I'm sure when you said Qatar, you mean Qatar graduates because they've given us the necessary skills and competencies. And if you have this kind of idea, it's up to us to actually come together and work together. So thank you for that. Thank you. I don't know. We encourage more comments or questions. OK, one, two. We have one here, then you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharon, for that very brilliant and um, highly thought-provoking um, lecture. I have three comments. One, um, I'm inspired by what you said, that we must eschew all forms of giving a lot of credence to um, support systems within the university systems that encourages mediocrity in terms of employment within the academia, if we actually want to be at the center of driving excellence and impacting the society. And what we are seeing, I mean, from your observation, is not only within the African continent, but much of it is within the African continent, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think we need to really try and address this if we want to influence policies. The second issue is about we believing in ourselves. I mean, within the African continent, we have a number of in institutions. We look up to the north and the east, but we, um, we depend less on ourselves. And so we need to rediscover ourselves. We need to engage ourselves more. And I think that will also bring about the homegrown solutions. And the other aspect, well, um, is within my own purview when you were talking about um, waste management and environmental issues. And for me, I, I feel always very saddened because environmental issues has been relegated to the background in various many issues. I gave in my inaugural lecture, I say, putting the cart before the horse. And in your lecture, you talked about, you know, making a lot of emphasis if we are to impact on health, um, engaging you know, social and other determinants um, that, can, uh, that can impact on health. How can that be when we are not appropriating resources, more of the resources, to the environmental health issues? I mean, I was involved in the, Afri uh, the antimicrobial resistance study uh, during the One Health approach. And Emphasis was placed on human health, animal health, and the environmental health component was relegated to the background. Within our institutions, I was in with, and I observed a lot of emphasis on the physical infrastructural development and the culture of maintenance and appropriation of resources to environmental management. How can we, in the African continent, manage the health issues without emphasis on environmental issues. For me, it's worrisome because, again, I repeat, it's placing the cat before the horse. We're talking about malaria vaccine, and yet there are a whole lot of issues. We're talking about slum environment. We are not appropriating resources to the management of the slum setting, housing environment, provision of water supplies, and then even sanitation issues to be able to tempt the tide of vectors. So these, I feel, which are influence, and all other leaders, we should be able to place a lot of emphasis on environmental issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the Dean, Faculty of Public Health, Professor Anna, for your questions and observations. And it's obvious Professor Fon's lecture has unearthed quite a robust discussion about things we need to do. Thank you so much. Dr. Lolo Roma. 
Thank you very much. My name is Fumila Laola Lorong from Community Medicine. Thank you, Professor Fon, for inspiring us. You talked about impediment. It was presenting, and then the, minister, the, the president was asking minister in charge of ICT, what is happening in your, in your ministry? Uh, because the evidence shows that we are not working. Uh, so these are the things that we really need uh, in order to move the con uh, our continent forward, uh, in order to change the narratives, uh, doing what we have the capability of doing, and uh, with that, the evidence, uh, it might be very slow, but as we continue to do this, then we can make uh, uh, important uh, contribution. And I also like the point that you raised that uh, universities have no business existing if we cannot produce thinkers. Uh, so putting thinking back to the PhD, not just uh, producing those who are not able to think, because that is what research-intensive universities are meant to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Sharon. Um, I've, I guess I've known you for some years now, and I can really testify to that building uh, at the Wits uh, University in which you actually um, got funding for. And that has been really an inspiration to some of us as to how to move things around. I'm, actually, I'm Professor Ikelu Akwa Jai, the director of the Institute for Advanced Medical Research and Training here in the um, College of Medicine. Um, I want to move away from, let me say, research and uh, to look at who you are as a person and your interest in women's uh, development. I think having you at this uh, pinnacle of uh, academic career is a very uh, important thing to women and uh, young women who are coming up in academics. So I, I would like you to sort of uh, provide some hints to women as to how to move on with the academic career and then move on uh, in their own lives as women. So sort of a mentoring, a role model uh, kind of way to help our women, especially the young ones uh, that are coming up. And I also want to say that the funding issue is also very crucial in this present day of Africa and more especially in Nigeria, in which uh, every uh, department, every faculty, the university is being asked to go and look for funding. This was not the case some years back. It was the government. But now go and look for funding in an economy that is dying. So I think I've got this idea. We say no, I've got this idea. So the point about how you raise the money is that you have to be good. You have to be good at what you do. And if you have that level of excellence, people want to work with you and they want you to be part of their team. And to go in the, to the team as an equal, to start off walking into that team as an equal. I'm not here. Too many of us will say, yes, okay, we like your, we don't even read what it is. We let them write it. We don't write it. We don't argue about it. We just say, whatever it is, I'll be the co-signatory, I'll be the co-PI. That's got to stop. We've got to be directing those researchers. Increasingly now, more and more of the funders are starting to think about putting their money directly into Africa. They can only do that if we stand up and be counted. If we, when there are calls, we put in quality applications. And the other side of it is that our institutions have got to be able to manage and account for that money. And so we've got to improve our systems and our responsiveness to that. But mainly, it's about being good at what you do. And when you say you're going to write a draft, you write it. You write it well. And you write it in the time that you said you were going to write it in. You're not late. You're not slack. You're not someone who does a, a poor quality work. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think people respond to and, and get you into a driving seat. Um, and in a way, it's a bit of an answer to the question about women. Um, 
You know, I had a funny experience when I was um, made uh, head of the School of Public Health at WITS. It was at the time of, of transition in South Africa, and um, I remember my dean saying to me, I said, oh, I just got this role because I'm a woman, um, because they wanted more women. And he said to me, firstly, that's not true, but let's assume it's true, prove them wrong. And a few months actually later, he said to me, you know, Sharon, it's lucky people take you seriously because you definitely don't know how to power dress. And I think that's part of the answer to the question, is you've got to take yourself seriously. You've got to put in the work. If you have to do something, you have to have done it and done it well. And then, you know, when you get into a car drive, so that's the first step. But then you've got to have the courage to get into the driver's seat. And I think often for women, I think it's true that if you are a woman, you probably have to work harder to be recognized than if you're a man. I think it's very similar to the way that black people everywhere in the world experience racism. You have to work harder to be seen on an equal footing as a white person. There are real discriminations in the world. We shouldn't pretend they're not there. But I think what you have to do is act as though you ignore them. Do what you do, do it well, and do it with confidence. Uh, so get into the driver's seat and drive well. Um, and, and that's a way of doing it. And then the personal side of it is complicated. Um, you know, it does mean that sometimes your husband has to do the washing up. Or you're not going to cook that meal. Or when you bring up our sons, they have to clean up just as much as our daughters. I think there are all these subtle things, and one of the exciting things that I've seen through Carter, um, so in Carter we have a, a very overt gender policy, uh, gender equity policy, and one of the things we recognize is that women often can't spend as much time um, on their research, on their publications, because they have a greater um, burden in the household, but another thing they have which isn't a burden is they have the privilege of motherhood. But the privilege of motherhood means that you're stopping to have a baby. Um, and that that's something that all of us want, both the mother and the father. And so what we recognized is that for the Carter Fellows, if they're pregnant, we don't want them to have to stop their fellowship. So we created, first of all, a break could take, which wouldn't interrupt, so they could take a break if they needed to. But we also said to them that if you've got a baby and you want to come to a jazz, we will pay for you to bring a caregiver so that you can continue at the jazz and still participate fully. And for the very first of being the primary caregiver, and actually, I really appreciate, uh, thank you. Um, and so I think we have to have the courage to do that. I will say that many of the other fellows brought their mothers or a nanny or somebody like that. Adebayo. Dr. Kudus Adebayo is to also Qatar graduates. Yeah, doing well, winning grants and doing exploits for Qatar Woo! and for himself. Dr. Kudus, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. I want to stand on higher ground. Thank you. Uh, it's a real privilege to have um, Professor Sharon Fond give this um, uh, thought-provoking lecture. We have been enriched um, in many ways, and we are thankful to her for taking the time to, to be here and then to share our thoughts and then to share um, wise words to motivate us to move forward, and particularly, you know, in terms of uh, raising critical issues uh, around why collaboration within uh, the African institutions um, is important, and then why uh, there's need to understand the role that university could play 
and should be playing in uh, knowledge economy more generally and in driving development uh, of African society. And that um, we should particularly identify, take the time to identify what the impediments are, engage with them, overcome them, while not um, ruling out the foundational uh, principle of critical thinking. So we are thankful to you for uh, your lecture. And um, secondly, we are very thankful to uh, Professor K.O. Adebowale, ably represented here by Professor Adenoke M. Bayroju, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic of our university, for the support um, over the past um, decade. We are grateful to science of our university at the academic and then administration level. We are able to mention all the names, but we are thankful and uh, deeply appreciative of your presence. And then all the days, the issue days, uh, leaders of our universities at multiple levels. We are thankful to you for being here. Uh, a lot of our professors are here as well and lecturers from all over the universities. Uh, we are thankful to you for being here. Uh, professor Simmons and graduates here present, thank you and thank you and support uh, this lecture. So we are thankful to you and on behalf of uh, Kata UI, uh, we'd like to say goodbye now and to um, ask you to enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kudus. Uh, for your information on YouTube, we have over 350 participants. And we have many comments as well, yeah. So please make, sh make sure you visit that YouTube to find out more. On Twitter also, Kata Twitter, we have a lot of comments that we have been making there. Shall we rise as we sing UI Anthem first, one and two, and Nigerian Anthem, only second verse for Nigerian Anthem. Thank you. Media. of Nigerian Ante. We've come to the end of the 10th Annual Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, CATA Public Lecture, ably presented by Professor Sharon Fon. The role of academia in society, a public health perspectives. Have a great day, all. We now come for pictures. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the eye table, table first. Eye table first. Eye table first. Yeah. Table first and then what, what the yeah. mm. Okay. So please, eye table, please. Let's come here to take group photograph. Well done, Prof. <laughs>
Qatar graduates, please, you can come here so I can take photographs as well. Qatar graduates, Qatar fellows, please come forward. Let's take photographs together. Qatar fellows, Qatar graduates, please come forward. Let's take group photographs together before we go for the other parts. Thank you. Man. It's fat, cut out. Oh. I thought you knew. <laughs> no, I, 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 I know. know. I, 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 I,